Tonight, Revolting News is honored by the presence of two very distinguished documentary filmmakers, Justin Shine and David Melman. They, they will be discussing their most recent film, Left on Purpose, an intense and personal study of Thule's friend and fellow peace activist, Mayor Vishner. Eighteen years ago, Thule and Mayor were partying at the War Resisters League Christmas party. But life took a turn for the worse for Mayor, so he decided that his final act of protest would be suicide. He asked his friend, Justin, to film and to document his decision. And this they did, giving us a film that recently won the Audience Award at the IFC Documentary Film Festival. As someone who was in that audience, I can understand why. His suicide note, published in the New York Times, read as follows forced into this world, left on purpose. Uh, I assume there's a double meaning to left considering mayors occupy and yippee politics. We can see Meyer's act as a final act of revolt. But Justin and David, you are going to discuss your film and tell me what he is revolting against. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I mean, I think Mayor saw everything through a political lens. I mean, he grew up and came of age at a, you know, in the, in the early 60s and really kind of uh, developed as the, the protest movement was developing, the civil rights movement and then the anti-war movement. So um, he kind of made his life in that community and made a decision to live with uh, kind of protest in, at the core of his being. Um, so, I mean, I think that he, um, uh, really any authority figure from a very early age, he, uh, he questioned for certain. Um, and I think that uh, he, 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 he said that, you know, he never quite felt like he fit in until he found the peace movement. Um, and that was a place where he could truly be among other people who were questioning authority, questioning the, the acts of people in power, um, and uh, for, for things that he believed in, things like peace, uh, the end of war, uh, things like uh, personal expression of love, of uh, the agency to do with his life and time and body, whatever he and his friends wanted to, uh, without being um, penalized for it uh, or controlled in any way. Um, and that the, that the job of government was to make sure that people were safe uh, and not to control them in any way. And that's what his approach was to school as a young person, what his approach was to war and uh, fighting in it, what his approach was to drugs and, uh, and sexuality. So those were all things that I think he uh, really found himself, uh, himself really moved by and at home with. And when the uh, movement ended and <clears throat> a lot of that went away, he uh, he found himself in an oppressed place, I think. Mm. But I think it's important to, to note that when I started the film, I didn't expect that this was the path I would be taking. Um, you know, I was interested in, in Mayer's history in the movement. I was interested in his perspective on the world today as somebody who had dreamed of, a, you know, a social revolution that had never really came. Um, I, I could tell that he was struggling, but I didn't know the extent of it. So, um, you know, I thought I was making a short profile of a, of a like fascinating man. And it was only, you know, months into the filming that he revealed to me that he wanted to, to, to leave, so to speak. Um, what was your reaction to that? Uh, I was shocked in a way, but... It, in another way, I guess I wasn't surprised because, you know, he would slowly revealing his kind of sadness to me and his, his drinking became, 
you know, drinking problem became more apparent. So uh, I was, you know, I was shocked because you know, it's not something you ever expect somebody to actually say to you. Um, and then I had to kind of reassess my role as a filmmaker. You know, is it possible to make this film uh, ethically? And I had to assess my role as a, as a friend because we had become friends. You know, what does one do? To, if you ask Mayor, how can I help you? He would say, you need to help me die. And that's not what we normally think of as helping somebody. Um, and so it, it, I had to kind of reassess the, the, whole, the whole thing. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Did he have any belief in an afterlife? Did he have any religious convictions or was he expecting anything besides it? Yeah, no, he was very uh, dedicated to uh, his, his atheism, to his belief mm -hmm. in, in humanity and nature but not uh not a spiritual nature so um yeah okay um so you know that uh dave and i have worked on many documentaries over the years and I, you know i think when you make nonfiction films you're constantly coming up against ethical questions and issues um, and those are kind of interesting as a filmmaker but you know this was kind of the, the granddaddy of them all like your, your subject wants wants to take his life and he is trying to implicate you um, you know mayor was a yippie and yippies believed in spectacle they believed in in right. getting their message out they believed in the using the media to, to, to convey the message. So, um, you know, understanding that, I, I, I was very uncomfortable because this was not my issue. Um, this, I didn't set out to make a, a film about this. Um, but it became clear to me, I did some research that, you know, first thing is that suicide is, is a growing um, mental health issue um, and that more you know the, the suicide rate for men mayor's age has increased dramatically over the past decade so this is you know mayor was not alone in this story as, as alone as he felt um, so it became clear to me that it was a story that was worth telling the question was how does one tell it without um, crossing certain boundaries and uh, you know, I got Dave uh, started to edit while Mayor was still alive, and it became clear to us, I think, that I needed to be part of the story. That, that part of the story was not just Mayor's struggle, but our relationship. So, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think that Mayor, um, you know, Mayor had a history of depression, um, but had uh, had. Uh, clearly to a period of his life where it wasn't where he was dealing with it um, and I think that uh, while this is a film about Mayer and about what was happening at the end of his life um, it's a film that's universal it's about aging and it's about aging in isolation and I think it's about what happens to a lot of people his age but I think you also have to, have to ask the question because he was such a um, I, I, ideal driven person um, is, you know, was the loss of the ideal, was the, did the world around him in some way uh, impact uh, his decision, whether it took a long time or a short time, um, and it's that question of, uh, did, is, is Mayer's act of, of rebellion or revolt and his desire to have agency and control over his life, which you can trace all the way back to his early beginnings as a revolutionary, um, and if, at, if this is his final political act, um, what, what is the sort of societal responsibility for that as well? Um, and I think that it's an intricate balance because I don't think you can blame it on one or the other. It's, it's just like any human being is a, is a, is a weave of, of so many threads. Um, 
which is what I think makes the story so interesting uh, and reson resonant. Um, but uh, I think that his disconnection from a movement, whether it passed him by or whether it was crushed in such a way that he couldn't relate, definitely impacted uh, the course that his life took and ultimately uh, that wound together with his depression uh, and you know coping with things that people who who weren't yippies but are his age uh, are coping with as they get older um, and I think we as a side take a lot of those things for granted but there's there's a lot going on that mm -hmm. that um, poverty being one of them certainly uh, you know uh, you know the, 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 the cost of health care and just the, the difficulty um, you know, trying to maintain a lifestyle that. Um, but go ahead. And, and and poverty as a as a result of a society that he that that he believed in being crushed. Like if 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 his society had come to be, yeah. if his ideal had been had been realized, would he have been mm -hmm. in the in the same place? And I think that he would have said. Look, I think that Merrill wanted to take take responsibility for his own life, but I think he also would have said that, acknowledged that that the you know it was it was a little, it was bigger than him and uh, sure, but I mean let's not I mean Mayer had great skills as an editor as a journalist um, as a activist um, he had a lot to offer the world um, and though yes the movement did fracture there certainly was. A, a lot of work, and there is always a lot of work to be done. And Mayer could have contributed to that um, in a big way. And there, in my opinion, there's no question that that his clinical depression made it difficult for him to see that as an option. Um, so, and I, you know, I wouldn't have gone forward making the movie if I if I wasn't in touch with his, his doctor and his psychiatrist and uh, I mean I knew that he was under their care and that they were doing their best to to treat him um, but you know he had been talking about this uh, for for years I, I, and I wasn't quite sure if it was if he really was planning to take his own life or if this was just his kind of way of being um, and getting attention, getting attention, time. and the fact of the matter that 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 his you know mentor Abby Hoffman and his close friends Phil Oakes and other friends, including Tom Frasad, had taken their lives. Um, only I, I feel like only made it more viable for him. Uh, there is this concept of of kind of contagion in suicide, where if somebody in your life takes their life, it statistically opens the door to, to your own uh, suicide. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a number of issues coming together, as Dave said, and certainly the alcohol didn't help, you know, it didn't, it, it um, over the years, I think, took a toll on, its, on his body and his brain, and while he was still very sharp and, um, had a lot of life in him, uh, you know. I, I, I think you know, they, they say that when you get to be 60 years old after 20, 30 years of alcohol abuse, that it really kind of you hit a wall in a way. Um, and Mayer didn't want to live that way anymore, and didn't want to deal with, didn't want to be a burden, and uh, you know, uh, couldn't see a bright future. Unfortunately, and I think that's common with a lot of the population. I think that the people of his age, you know, when they were coming up, didn't expect to live till they were 70, 80, 90 years old. There was a whole different expectation. And while um, uh, I think that a lot of the, the problems that, that, that are having of, of men in his age group have to do with exactly that, they have to do with health, uh, comfort. Uh, financial issues that come with living longer than you planned and that's um, uh, and I think you add that to um, to mayor's you know desire to 
to, and, and firm belief that what he was suffering from was as real as any terminal disease. And, and you then combine that with, I mean, these are the arguments that he would make, combine that with his desire to have agency. Um, Acting, you know, I think that it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a statistical reality. Um, you know, I, in starting to put this film together, we, we contacted the, uh, a specialist in suicideology, uh, somebody that works with suicide prevention, and they have very um, set rules that they believe the media should follow in discussing suicide because they feel that it shouldn't be glorified, it shouldn't be uh, talked about casually, and um, you know, it was very helpful in, in at least opening our eyes to how we spoke about it. Um, you know, they, they were very clear that we, they didn't, they preferred if we didn't specifically tell his method of, of, um, of killing himself. Um, and I respect that and understand that. I mean, um, just as I wasn't going to give Mayer the information, I thought he was capable of figuring it out himself if that's what he wanted to do. Um, I feel like uh, it's wasn't. I wasn't going to create a how-to <laughs> video. Um, so, and part of that is the fact that you know. Uh, my role wasn't just as a friend, but as a journalist, and um, I think that there's a, certainly a responsibility. Okay, I have some questions from a neighbor and friend of, of Mayer's by mm -hmm. the name of Therese Coe, mm -hmm. who is a poet, writer, and professor. And she lived across the street on McDougal Street from him, mm -hmm. and she sent me these questions by email mm -hmm. and said, uh, Ask him what he saw and heard from Mayer, but what was Justin's observations? Well, I think your whole film is your observations, right? Sure. I mean, you know, uh -oh. Mayer was quite a charismatic guy. I had met him on another film, and I made a film called No Impact Man. Yeah. Mayer was in that, so um, go ahead. Okay, did he sense any tragic quality in the planned suicide? whether Mayer said it or not? Well, uh, I mean, I think suicide by its nature is a tragedy, even if it's something that is, even if it's something that someone thinks is their best option, I mean, it's, it's a tragedy that it's come to that, that there's not, that Mayer didn't feel that he had other options. I mean, I respected his, his, his rights to his own life and death, but yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, this is something that I came away with, um, is that this, the whole concept of suicide is such a broad concept um, that there are very different scenarios between a young person who's depressed and um, is contemplating suicide or who hasn't seen a, a, a doctor um, and somebody like Mayer who, while it's tragic and, um, you know, he had been under doctor's care for years and um, while it was his thinking was clouded by his depression, I, I think that he made a, a um, very deliberate decision. It's not, it wasn't a, a rash decision. Hey, was he ever funny? Did he make you laugh? In the film he does, right? Yeah. Quite a bit. He maintained his sense of humor throughout this gloom and depression. He had a twinkle in his eye and he always... How, how Could you remember any funny incidents? Well, even just like that, at that at one of his deepest moments, it's in the film, where he yeah. is sitting there and he's just recovered from a, a drinking binge yeah. and Justin brings him the, the liquid uh, food and, uh, and Justin says to him, well, you know, Maybe if you stopped drinking, you would, uh, you could, you have a little more, more money, and you wouldn't be in this horrible situation. And I ever looked at him and said, "Yeah." And if your grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and that's typical mayor. Going back to the tragedy line, mayor's to me uh, is is tragic in another sense. He's almost, 
as a in the literary sense. I mean, he's kind of a Shakespearean character. He is so um, he is so fully aware of his situation, yet so blind to it to to it as well, and the possibilities of it. And he's walking around in it in this deep existential. Granted, we've captured him at a at, 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 in the middle of this existential crisis, or obviously towards the end, but. I guess if you're in the middle of an existential crisis, it means the end is near. Uh, sometimes, but uh, he is a tragic. He's a tragic character. He's a tragic. The you know the way a Shakespearean character is tragic because he has that complexity and and uh, so much is at stake. Uh, and there is so much good yet. Yet, ultimately, there is a a deep and dark and tragic ending to him. Uh, so. And he used to talk about um, his fear that he would lose the will to die, um, which is kind of poetic and tragic and ironic. Ironic, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Had he given up on women and sexual relations? Well, I mean, like like activism, uh, he didn't feel that he that he he had the patience or the... There were so many things, actually. I mean, he felt like there was no woman... Because I mean, he, throughout the years, he had put... Uh, he had a, 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 a classified ad that he put out there. Yeah, he did. Um, he was looking... He wanted a relationship. Um, but ultimately, he, he didn't know how to make that happen in a long-term way. But I think also, by the time the filming started happening here, he was, he had kind of, he hadn't given up on wanting it, he had given up on the realistic possibility of having it, having to do with his, the fact that he couldn't get himself organized, the fact that he had no money, the fact that, um, that he was too far down this road uh, that it really was, there was no woman that would want him. And, and like he says in the film, if there's someone out there for me, I know her already. <laughs> but the irony is that he said that sitting on a bed with a woman that was clearly interested in him. <laughs> uh, you know, that, you know, the glass half empty kind of uh, situation that he was in, he, he, he didn't allow himself the, the possibility. And similarly with the money, I mean, towards the, right at the end of his life, he got a $50,000 check for his things from oh, the yeah. University of Michigan. and gave it away in a second. So, That's amazing. Uh, yeah. well, I think it's easy for people on the outside and who don't have experience with depression to look at Mayer and say, it was right in front of them. All he had to do was do something. All he had to do was try. Mm -hmm. And I think that the nature of his depression and the nature of his personality and his stubbornness conspired against him in a way, to take advantage or to even see the possibilities beyond maybe short blips when the garden was in the springtime and he was out of the house and he had some hope for good things to happen. They were, uh, he was, they, they, those hopes were quickly dashed and I think that was the case with relationships for sure. Well, there's wonderful footage of the garden in your mm. movie. It's so positive and life-giving and that's how you met him, right? At a community yeah, garden. Yeah, I met him at the at the um, uh, the uh, was it? the LaGuardia Community Garden when he had been one of the original members. And um, even though he said he hated gardening because uh, you know it was so unpredictable, and I mean it was something that gave him uh, a reason uh, and really put him in touch with with the earth and. And he had gone to agricultural high school in, hmm. in, in Queens and had always been interested in, in, in gardening. Um, and he was for many years the only guy growing vegetables in a garden of uh, flower growers. Um, hmm. uh, so for him that was a kind of a Did political he grow statement. Pot? Did he grow marijuana? Not that I know no. of. Um, no, and if he did, he, he wouldn't have been able to grow enough for his uh, <laughs> for his needs. Um, but um, yeah, he was he was a big pot smoker, and um, I mean, I I think unlike 
alcohol. I think that the marijuana really was was medicinal for him. Helped him to to interact with the world and, and be more relaxed. And um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, there was certainly there's a great legacy of, uh, that uh, we hope to preserve and to to spread. We hope to teach. I mean, we feel like so many people below the age of 40 have no idea what the yippies were, or um, and their legacy is not uh, so established, unfortunately, in, in, in textbooks. I mean, their legacy is alive and well in, you know, Occupy and in the strategy of, of many activists, but um, many don't know about it, and so hopefully we'll be able to get people interested in, in that history as well as kind of the, the issues around aging and depression and, um, you know, activism. Okay, so where can we see your film? Did Therese uh, Mayer's neighbor wanted to go see it and she couldn't find it anywhere. Where are we most likely That's to true. be able to see your documentary? Well, you know, we finished, we really finished it a few months ago. Um, we had our premiere um, at the end of September at Woodstock, at the Woodstock Film Festival, right. uh, which was great because that felt like a, a very home crowd. Uh, and then we played it in Europe a bit at, and then at Doc NYC. And we are at this phase where we're showing at festivals and looking for a distributor and hoping that uh, we get some momentum so that we can get it online and Netflix or something like that and, and have it on TV, whether it's PBS or HBO. So, and there might be a small theatrical um, distribution. We certainly think that there's a big possibility for educational, um, you know, film schools, social work schools. Um, uh, so I think there's great possibility, but right now uh, it's just the beginning of the yeah. process, yeah. So where can you be reached? If anybody wants to show your film, if oh, anybody sees great. this, uh, where can you? My be email is justin at shadowboxfilms.com. And you're on Facebook too. I'm on Facebook. There's a Left on Purpose Facebook page. There's a leftonpurpose.com is our website. Dave has the David at shadowboxfilms.com. Um, you know we, uh, you know, it's been a long haul working on this film, five years or more, but. In some ways, it's just you know the life of the film is just beginning, and uh, we really want to keep it keep it alive, keep it going. Okay, so that's it for our revolting news show. Uh, thank you very, very much. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.